Uh, I'm so glad to be here. Last Sunday, Melanie and I were at our home church, and I had a chance to preach there, and my brother and sister were there. It was really cool. My sister joked that, you know, the three of us had not been together in that church that my dad pastored when we were all kids. Three of us hadn't been together without having a family funeral, so it was great that we were there just to have a chance to worship together. Well, um, we've been in a series of messages over these last weeks entitled, We Are the Church. We've been talking about, you know, what does it mean that, that God calls us to be the church? And just to do a bit of review, uh, you know, the, the word church is the combination of two Greek words, ekklesia. One form, or one part of that word is an assembly or a gathering of people. The second part of that word is those who have been called out. So you are the ecclesia, the called out assembly, the called out ones that God has called us out to live out our faith in Jesus Christ among our friends and family uh, and neighborhood. Another important thing, and I know I mentioned this before and you'll probably hear me say it again. You know when a pastor says, If you don't remember anything else I say, remember this. Have you ever heard a pastor say that? Actually, that's not true. We want you to remember everything we say all the time. But I know that that isn't the case. But the, the, the church of Jesus Christ that we are a part of exists not only for us who are here. We know that, of course, to grow in fellowship. I mean, it's one of the things... I love about Journey Church, what God is doing here. There's just a rich sense of fellowship and care for one another, which is awesome. But we exist not only for those of us who are here, but we also exist for those who are not yet here. I mean, that's not like the Kiwanis or the Masons or the Rotary Club or whatever whatever organization you may think of. We exist for people who are not yet here, which is a radical kind of concept. Because we want to do anything and everything that we can to make sure there's a welcoming environment for people to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And I know that's at the heart of who you are, and that's at the heart of this church as well. So when I was here two weeks ago, we talked about the church in Antioch. Anybody remember two weeks ago? Why can I remember 30 years ago, but two weeks ago is like, what, what, what happened two weeks ago? But we looked in Acts chapter 11 at some of the descriptions, particularly of the way that the church in Antioch was planted. The incredible story of, of how after, after Stephen was martyred, Stephen was stoned to death, There was a huge persecution that that went over all of the believers in Jerusalem, and all of them, hundreds of people, had to flee Jerusalem, and as we look back, we can see it's a part of God's plan to take the gospel out of Jerusalem. Only the apostles were left. And we talked about the fact that that, uh, this church in Antioch was planted, Acts 11.20, men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch. And began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news of the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So we want to continue on to look at the church in Antioch. We're going to, we're going to jump over to Acts 13. Acts 13, the first three verses, tell us some more things about this fellowship in Antioch. An amazing group of people, as we talked about before, as Acts chapter 11 tells us, that it was in Antioch that these believers, these Christ followers, were first called Christians. They were first called Christians in Antioch. So we want to continue to look at some of the things we learn about this church in Antioch. So open your Bibles or your devices to Acts 13, those first three verses And this will be up on the screen as well. Listen to God's word. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after... 
They had fasted and prayed again. They placed their hands on them and sent them off. On the back of your uh, bulletin, you have some fill-in-the-blanks. I know some of us, depending on our personality, love these fill-ins. Some of us could care less. So whatever your personality, we're going to fill in those blanks at the end of the service. So don't get stressed out if I don't say fill in the blank until a little bit later, okay? But hold on to those because there's some important things that I want us to see in conclusion. Now, a very important spiritual principle that we see in Acts chapter 13, and it's a characteristic of the church, or it should be a characteristic of the church, and this is very simple, and you're going to say, Matt, well, no kidding, but here it is, in the body of Christ, we are not all the same. It's like a deathly silence came over the crowd. No, I mean, that's a really important principle To say, we're not all the same. We don't come from the same backgrounds. We don't don't share all the same occupation. Our stories are different. And I would submit to you, and I believe with this case study from Acts 13, that's a good thing. That the body of Christ is the place where we gather in, even though we're from different backgrounds and socioeconomic realities and ethnicities, we gather in because of who Jesus is. Amen? I love that about the, about the body of Christ. And we see the, the idea of, of different spiritual gifts. In the church in Antioch, the text says there were prophets and teachers. That's Acts 13.1. That's not an exhaustive list. But the the author, Dr. Luke, wants us to know something about the character of the people that were in leadership in this church in Antioch. Before Jesus was crucified, he told his followers that he would return to heaven, but he promised to leave with them a helper, the Holy Spirit. John 14, uh, 16 and 17 says, And I will ask the Father... And he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. And so the spiritual principle to understand is that we're not all the same. And we've also been gifted differently. And we believe the Bible teaches that when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we're given a spiritual gift or gifts. If you you look at 1 Corinthians 12, um, Ephesians 4, sorry, uh, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4 are the the passages that lay out uh, the the whole concept of spiritual gifts, 20-some different spiritual gifts. And so Luke wants us to know that that in Antioch, uh, there were these leaders in the church, pastors and teachers that were a part of what God was doing. These gifts given were essential for spreading the gospel, leading the church, building up believers, and serving others as an example of God's love. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 says, this salvation which was first announced by the Lord, which was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to God's will. So, in teaching about spiritual gifts, you know, the New Testament is clear that we don't envy the gifting of another person. I mean, when, you know, I see somebody that, that has huge mercy gifts, somebody whose heart just bleeds for people, do you know anybody like that? They can, they can be in a situation and be talking to somebody, and if they're crying, they're going to cry. I have a daughter like that. You know, she says she can walk into the room, and I, I, I've seen her do this, And she can sort of get the emotional pulse of where somebody is at who is hurting so she can come alongside. I I see that and I think, you know, that's really amazing. That's not the way that I'm gifted. (laughs) I'm gifted differently. And so sometimes, you know, sometimes that's why 
God gave us spouses. Sometimes my wife will say to me, you know, do you, do you understand what's happening here? It's like, I have no idea. And she'll tell me. Because partially, I guess, because I'm a man or for whatever reason. But, um, you know, or you, you see somebody like up here who has the gift of teaching or preaching. And you think, oh, man, if I could only be like them, my, you know, my life would be wonderful. Well, well, Paul says, don't envy the spiritual gift that somebody else has. But God, if you've come to faith in Jesus, God has given you a unique spiritual gift. And it's important to see that lived out. And so, in this church in Antioch, we see different gifts that, uh, that are in display. Now, gifts are different from talents. Uh, I, I love our worship team. Don't you love these guys that lead us in worship every Sunday? They are awesome. I said to, I think it was to Michael, you know, I, I recognize there are some limitations in this season and we don't have live worship, but I said to Michael, I don't know that I have ever seen worship done as well as you all do it here at Journey Church. You're blessed. I, I'm, not a, I'm, not, I'm not a musician, but I can tell you I'm able to worship, and that's wonderful. I've been in some other settings and some other places where it was really difficult to worship. So very, very thankful for those of you that are, that are leading in worship. But sometimes... You know, I, I, I don't play a musical instrument. It's like my, my only instrument is my phone that I, you know, try to find music on. My wife plays the piano and sings and keyboard, and I'm, you know, I'm lucky to find the, the radio. Um, and so there's a danger both in terms of spiritual gifts, but also in terms of looking at other people and the talents that they have and saying, I wish I would be more like them. And there's an appropriate kind of understanding that says, you know, I want to be mature in Jesus like this person or that person. That's a good thing. But to somehow think that the gifts somebody else has are better than the gifts you have is undermining what God's done in you and through you. And that's so important to keep in mind. So a few cautions. Uh, I've already said this about spiritual gifts, but don't envy somebody else's spiritual gifts. Also, live at peace with the way God has gifted you in personality and spiritual gifts. And then the last thing I want to say, and this is really important, give grace to people who are different than you are. Is that possible? <laughs> you know, it's an amazing realization that everybody doesn't have to be like you. Amen? Amen? Again, it feels strangely quiet when I said that. We all are gifted differently, and that's a good thing. I'm so grateful for the people who have differing gifts in the body of Christ that God calls to, to serve and to live with, with uh, one another. Now, it's important to recognize that this leadership team in Antioch that Acts 13 tells us describes an incredibly gifted team in Antioch, but a team that was very different. Listen again to Acts 13.1. In the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, uh, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, uh, Manian, who had been, uh, been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. And so uh, we have Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas and Paul were, were both Jews, but Paul was from Tarsus, and Barnabas was from Cyprus, so they would have been raised in very different uh, cultural environments. Even though they were both Jews, they would be coming at things very differently. And then there's Simeon, also called Niger. Niger in Latin means black, and so we can assume that Niger was an African, so it's logical to assume that you know, we have these two Jews from different cultural backgrounds. Here's Simeon, an African. And then we meet Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene is modern-day Libya. And so the, the understanding is that, that Manian probably was, was an Arab, an African, North African or Arab. And then the last person that God's Word tells us that is a part of this team is Manian, and it says that Mannion was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. 
So we can assume that Mannion was raised in the home of Herod. So he comes from a, a, a background of wealth and power. Uh, Dr. Ray Bakke in his book, A Theology as Big as the City, says this, Antioch, the first large group city center, had a five-person pastoral team from, two, uh, from three continents. Two Jews from very different backgrounds, Barnabas and Saul, an African, a North African or an Arab, and a rich kid. So in the, in the first place that Christians are called Christians in Antioch, the pastoral team, the team of leaders in the church, were not all the same. They weren't all the same in terms of gifting. They weren't all the, the same in terms of their background. They weren't all the same. And yet God brought them together to create this incredible environment in the church in Antioch. Well, how do we navigate situations where people are different from us. You know, that's a, that's a super challenge, isn't it? And, and, you know, so much division in the world today and even in the church. You know, our, our nation was appalled a week ago yesterday when uh, a, a would-be lone assassin was flying under the radar of the Secret Service and nearly murdered President Donald Trump. And renewed calls then were given to ratchet down the, the rhetoric on the airways and for good reason. And right and left-leaning Americans, Christians included, and yes, there are Christians on all sides of the political fence. You may not agree with that, but that's true. Acknowledge that with both words and actions really matter in a moment like this. And as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we just need to understand that our allegiance is to Jesus. Our allegiance is not to one particular political party. Our allegiance is to Jesus. It's all right to have strong beliefs. That's okay. That's good. That's American. But I'm just simply saying our first allegiance is to Jesus and Jesus alone. And hopefully this really terrible situation will help us to kind of tone down the language. I love what John Wesley said. John Wesley, the, the founder of the incredible movement that, that we're a part of in our history. He, he wrote about elections, and this is what he said. I met with those of our society or of a local church who had votes in the ensuing election and advised them, number one, to vote without fee or reward for the person they judged most worthy. Right? That's important. Secondly, to speak no evil of the person they voted against. And finally, perhaps, perhaps most importantly for us to hear, to take care their spirits were not sharpened against those that voted on the other side. So that's John Wesley writing in the 18th century, which I think is good 21st century advice. The ability to listen to someone you disagree with and to show love is so important, but not to compromise our beliefs, but to model Christ-likeness in listening. You know, that, uh, that great theologian, Dr. Phil, said, uh, God gave you one mouth and two ears for a reason. And I hope we're characterized by people who, who listen. I, I found a posting this week that was so powerful that I wanted to read it to you. Um, it's from a guy named Flip Spiceland, which is a crazy name. I think he was like a weather meteorologist, weather person, weatherman, uh, a number of years ago. But this is what he wrote. He said, as the world fights to figure everything out, I'll be holding doors for strangers, letting people cut in front of me of traffic. Ooh, that's hard. Letting people cut in front of me in traffic saying good morning, keeping babies entertained in grocery lines, stopping to talk to someone who is lonely, tipping generously, waving at police, sharing food, giving children a thumbs up, being patient with sales clerks, smiling at passers-by, and buying a stranger a cup of coffee. Why, he writes, because I will not stand to live in a world where love is invisible. Join me, he writes, in showing kindness, understanding, and judging less. Be kind to a stranger. Give grace to friends who are having a bad day. Be forgiving with yourself. 
If you can't find kindness, be kindness. If you can't find kindness, be kindness. Boy, if there's a, if there's a, world, a word that we need to hear headed into this election season, I believe it's, it's something like that. So we have this amazing team that is so different from different cultural backgrounds, different experiences, that they're, they're coming together. But notice what God's word says. It says, as they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. As they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, something amazing happened. They heard God speak. And I don't know if they were in a prayer meeting gathered around in somebody's home or exactly where they were when this happened, but there was the, the sense among the group that God had, God had spoken. God had said something. Now, I, I've never heard God speak with an audible voice, but I have sensed in my own heart and spirit that the Lord is saying something. But the model that's laid out here in Acts 13 is so beautiful. I love this. And I'm so encouraged by, by the way God's word, God word, uh, God's word help us to explain that. that they, they were fasting and they were, they were praying, worshiping and fasting. And again, they heard the Holy Spirit say, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Notice what happens next. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So this is a, a really a beautiful model of how these people were together in worship. They'd been preparing themselves. They'd been fasting. And it, 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 somebody in the group, or, or perhaps several in the group, said, we think the Holy Spirit is saying we need to set apart Saul and Barnabas because God has more for them. And rather than act on that, the scripture says, again, so after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them. So it was fasting, or it was worship and fasting, the sense that God was speaking, and prayer and fasting to determine what God said. I, I, I think that is so powerful. You know, in contrast to that are some environments where you know, somebody has a word from the Lord. Have you ever been a part of that? And, you know, you wonder exactly where, where does that come from? It, it may not really sound like the Lord. But what these leaders in Antioch are modeling is this understanding of spiritual sensitivity. That they were so serious about hearing God speak and about being obedient that they were fasting and worshiping. They heard God say something and they tested the spirits and they then placed their hands on them and sent them off. I love that. The biblical principle here really is that the Holy Spirit spoke and the body of Christ confirmed. And that's still in operation today. What a great model that we want to live out as well. What God says to the individual needs to be confirmed by leaders in the body of Christ. Verse 3, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. You know, um, as a parent, you know, our, our daughters are 38 and 40. So, uh, you know, I look back, I don't know about you parents that have adult kids, but I look back and think, man, I wish we would have done this. I wish we wouldn't have done that. Any, any parents think that? You may not be brazen, brave enough to raise your hands. But, you know, one of the things that my wife and I did, when our, starting from when our kids were small, was we would pray a prayer of blessing over them. And that was a part of the, you know, 14 drinks of water, getting up eight times to go potty, um, that they, you know, they knew that before they went to sleep, we were going to place the, our hands on their head and we were going to pray a prayer of blessing on them. And so my wife and I would be at another place in the house and they're getting ready for bed and they get into bed. And so, you know, they would yell, Dad, Mom, we're ready for our blessing. Ready for our blessing. So we'd go in and talk to them, pray with them, and then put our hands 
on their heads. And we would say, peace, I give to you my peace. I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And they'd go to sleep. Did you know that there are people within a stone's throw of this building that are not saying in literal words, but are crying out, Journey Church, we're ready for our blessing. We're ready for our blessing. And if the church is going to be all that God intended it to be, as I said earlier, this is a place where where not only we come and have great fellowship, but there always is that understanding that we're looking for, waiting for, praying over, fasting together for people who are not yet here, who need to know the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you, you all have been so gracious as I'm uh, stumbling around trying to remember names. Um, so I, I, it's going to take me a while <laughs> to, to figure that out. Thank you for your patience. So I don't know all of your stories. I don't know. Um, I don't know the journeys that you've been on, but I do know this. I know that this is a place, this is a church where you're going to be encouraged to walk with Jesus, encouraged to go deep in your faith, encouraged perhaps for the first time to make a commitment to say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I, w- I want to be yours. I want to confess my sin. I want to, I want to live a new life. And, and the church body will rejoice in that. But nobody, I promise, nobody's going to beat you upside the head with the Bible. But you know what we're going to do? We're going to love you. We're going to love you. I believe that's the call that, that God has on us as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so now, take out, take out your notes. You know, there comes a point in, in any sermon or in any teaching where you ask the, the so what question. That was great, Pastor, but so what? What does this mean? Well, I want to share four points of application with you from this church in Antioch. Some things that God, uh, I believe God wants to say to us. So the first fill in the blank is guard your heart. Guard your heart. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Guard your heart. I was on the phone with a friend yesterday. He called just to check on me. And we were talking back and forth about some circumstances, some situations. And, uh, you know, he was recounting a story where uh, he was let go from a ministry, uh, never really understood why, uh, really kind of still grieving about that. And so we were, you know, we were talking together and we... uh, we reference the important spiritual principle that we don't hold on to hurt, particularly hurt towards other people, because that's a cancer that can eat away at our soul. As someone said, you know, bitterness is swallowing poison and expecting someone else to get sick. And so a part of what I'm suggesting to you today as we think about this example of the church in Antioch is that we guard our hearts against any kind, of, any kind of bitterness or against any kind of anger or malice towards other people. You know, as I said, it's important that we have strong convictions. I, I, I believe God's word is true. I believe this book is relevant for today. It's inspired. And there, there's no but in that sentence. It is. And we can have strong opinions about what we believe. What I'm suggesting to you is that as followers of the Lord Jesus, we guard our hearts. We don't hold bitterness against somebody that we may disagree with. We don't hold on to stuff. You know, we try to work it through. If we can't work it through, we find a good Christian counselor to talk to or to a pastor or someone who is trained to help us. But one of the challenges is to guard our hearts. Secondly, Listen carefully. Listen carefully. I love what the Apostle John says. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone into the world. 
This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come is in the, in the flesh is from God. And so what the Apostle John is saying to us, you know, my admonition to listen carefully is there's the Jesus test. The Jesus test is, you know, what does this person, what does this ministry, what does this entity say about who Jesus is? God's son, born of the Virgin Mary, lived a sinless life, fully God, fully man, died on the cross, stone cold dead. Three days later, he rose again. Scripture tells us that he he ascended to heaven and he's coming back. And if there are if there are perspectives that lift someone else or some other thought process higher than Jesus, where we're asked to put our hope in something else other than the risen Christ, John says to be careful that we stray into error. So listen carefully. Ask that God would help us. Third, fill in the blank, love everyone. Love everyone. Ephesians 4, 32 and 33 from the message. Make a clean break with all cutting, backbiting, profane talk. Be gentle with one another, sensitive. Forgive one another as quickly and thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. Ephesians 4, 32. You know, in the NIV, I have written in my Bible that, you know, this is the marriage success verse. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. That's good. Good advice that we would be gracious, as, as Flip Spiceland said, that we would be kind in an age when it appears there's little kindness. The last thing, last fill in the blank, be wise. Be wise. Be wise in the way, Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. I love that admonition from the Apostle Paul to the church in Colossae. He says, believers... Be careful, be wise in the ways that you interact with people who don't claim the name of Jesus. Make sure that you're not a bad example, but rather point them to Jesus Christ. Point them to the Son of God as the answer to all of the challenges that we face. Well, as I said, the the beauty of this text from Acts 13 tells us more about this church in Antioch. You know, as we read in Acts 11, that, that when, the, when they began to witness to people who were not like them, and when Barnabas came and he saw what, what the church was doing, it says a great number of people believed and came to the Lord. And that's the goal. That's the goal of the church. And as we talked about earlier, we are the church. And when we leave here after the pulled pork picnic, the church is going to go to your house And the church is going to go to my house. And that's an incredible privilege, but also a great responsibility. And my prayer for us as a congregation during this season of transition is that God would continue to mold us, to make us into the person of his son. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for this example of the the church in Antioch where there are people that were were gifted differently. There There were people from different cultural backgrounds, from different communities and parts of the world. And also there were mature believers who listened to you. And they tested those spirits with worship and prayer and fasting. God, thank you that you continue to speak. Thank you that you continue to help and model what it means to know you and love you and trust you. And so we're grateful, God. Thank you for Journey Church. Thank you for this season of transition. It reminds us that our dependency is on you. We trust you. 
God, we pray as we've been praying for a number of months now that that you would lay your hand on the next pastor of this church. You know who that is. We don't know. But God, we want to pray in your timing that you would call them to Moses Lake, call them to Journey Church. And God, thank you that we have the privilege of being eyewitnesses to what you're doing here. God, thank you that that we can be together. Thank you for the food that's been prepared that we're going to enjoy in just a few minutes. And so we pray your blessing on that food. All the folks that work for hours and hours in the middle of the night to make this delicious pork for us. So blessed to our bodies, Jesus. We thank you and give you all the praise, all the glory. And we pray this together, Jesus, in your wonderful name. Amen.